Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Deborah Morgan. Today's deep dive conversation is with one of the Triangle's most interesting and recognizable people. And depending on where your ACC allegiances lie, you may have very strong feelings about him one way or the other. I'm talking about former Duke men's basketball coach Mike Krzyzewski. Here's part one of our in-depth conversation about his life after the court, recorded earlier in January. Coach, thank you so much for, yeah, you're for this time. It's so great to see you. Thank you. You, you look very happy and healthy. Uh, if you can say one thing, what is the one thing that you're enjoying most about not coaching? Yeah, I think the mind space that you have where you can, you know, as a leader, whether you're a coach or a leader of an organization, you're, you're always thinking of plans that you're doing, stuff that's going on right now in the future, that your people and whatever, and you're, you know, you, you really aren't thinking about you. You're, you're thinking about taking care of everyone. And now, for me, uh, it's about me and my family. And it's, uh, it's very good. You know, I, it's kind of new. The first time I, that happened, uh, we were at St. Mary's graduation. Carly, one of my uh, granddaughters, was graduating last spring in a beautiful ceremony on a Sunday morning. And uh, we're out there, and eight of our grandchildren were sitting in front of us. And it was beautiful. And, you know, sometimes graduations can go long and whatever, but it was beautiful. And on the way back, I'm driving with Mickey, my wife, and, and I said, you know, I was really good. And I said, you know, something happened to me during the event that was weird. He said, what was that? He said, I said, I was only thinking of the event. Mm. It, it, uh, Being it, present. Yes. You can, you can be present now. Just, uh, and I have so much to be present for or with, with my 10 grandkids, my three daughters and their family, and you know, so many of the friends and uh, people that we've uh, become so close with. One of my favorite memories is coming in here probably 20 years ago. You were kind enough to sign a book for Father's Day for my dad. <laughs> and I remember seeing just grandkids running everywhere. I think Michael was about that high. Yeah. And uh, I know how important family is to you. And they live very close to you, right? So, right. I mean, now you're really able to, to be connected. Yeah. They've always been a part, I feel like, of your basketball career. I mean, certainly Mickey by your side, your girls in the stands mm. screaming, <laughs> and for the biggest fans of Duke. And uh, so, so now to have that time with them must be really special. You know, it, it is. You know, we love Duke. We love Durham and North Carolina. This has been a, an amazing place. Uh, to raise our family, and all th three of our like our daughter's families are here within 10 minutes of us. One family lives seven-tenths of a mile away, and uh, so uh, that's unusual. You know, uh, we're very, very lucky to have that, and as a result, you're never, uh, <laughs> you always have an activity that you could go to. I have four grandsons playing basketball, uh, one doing ninja. Uh, people, you know, my granddaughters are in uh, Montessori school. There's always some uh, activity going on, and it, uh, it's really close, and they become close. You know, where sometimes, yeah, I got a cousin in New York, or no, right. no, I got a cousin right here. Yeah. I'm spending the night with my cousin, that kind of stuff. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah that, a lot of families don't have that, that's for they sure. They do not. Yeah. We're very fortunate. So how much do you revere the role of grandpa? Uh, or is I, that I, what they call you? You can't, you can't say grandpa. you got to say poppy. Poppy, okay. Yeah. And uh, no, I love it. You know, I uh, actually i am getting to spend more quality time uh, with some of them than I did with my own daughters because of the demands, especially early, early on, of trying to build a program and everything. So uh, uh, I really like it. I'll, I'll call them. Uh, yesterday I watched two of my grandsons in two different games in middle school basketball. Uh, we were all there as a family. 
And then last night I called each one of them. I said, you know, Rem, you really take, you know, you're really driving the ball well and, you know, and asked him about stuff. And then John David, I said, I, I cannot believe you dribble so well because you spend all your time jumping around doing ninja. <laughs> you know, how the, how the heck, heck do you control that ball more? So I, I like the fact that we're, you know, we have those relationships. Do they ask for your advice playing basketball? A little bit, yeah. And uh, my daughters asked me to tell them. And I said, well, you know, just call it. You know, I don't want to be this overbearing guy, you know, but I'll goof with them a little bit. Or if they're at our house, I'd say, you know, uh, Quinn, you know, I was watching you on defense. You know, I don't know why you have your hands up here. <laughs> you should have your hands down here. Does that make sense? And then I might show them some footwork and make them look clumsy and say, look, I'm 75. I'm, I don't look clumsy in that one thing. Uh, think of how good you would look. So stuff like that. And, but to do it more lighthearted. And uh, I find, you know, even when I coached, you know, people think of us just yelling at, peop at our guys and that. But humor, humor plays a big part of teaching, but also of developing a relationship. And uh, I want that to be uh, kind of a central thing, you know, with the, with the grandkids. Humor like good ribbing? Yeah, you know, to rib one another or, you know, you tell us a, a story. We're trying to get one of my grandkids to eat more. And uh, so I said, you know, are you getting tired of people telling you, you know, uh, to eat? And he said, yes, Poppy. And I said, you know what? I'm one of those people and I'm getting tired of telling you that. And I said, so if you have two people getting tired of the same thing, it means we should make each other not tired. Does that make sense? And he said, I think it does. <laughs> I think it does. But we'll see if that makes them uh, start eating. Now, as a parent, as a grandparent, what advice as Coach K would you give to parents and grandparents out there who want their children to be the next star at Duke? Yeah, well, just to, you know, one, the youngster has to have fun in whatever he or she is, is doing. And, uh, and they should do more than one thing. You, you know, like you're, be, even in, in sport, don't just play one sport as you're young. You know, do a bunch of different things. Like in the NBA now, there's so many international players. Soccer for them was a big thing. Their footwork is amazing. Uh, and... Uh, and their, their movement, because they, uh, in soccer, you have to run, uh, but you use your feet, and uh, uh, track is a, is a good thing, sometimes cross-country, uh, but also to learn what it is to be maybe really good in one sport, and okay in another, where you might not start, but you, you learn to be a, a contributor, and you learn what sport is about. And uh, I think you got to be careful not to have tunnel vision too, uh, too early. And then when you watch your youngster play, look, they're going to make mistakes, man. And, uh, you know, don't, you know, don't over-criticize them, you know. Like, talk to them about it. And, and, and don't always ask them how many points you scored or did you win, that, uh, like, did you have fun? Did you play hard? Tell me if you thought you played hard. Uh, what did you like about what you, what you did? Here's a couple things I liked, and here's, here's one thing I thought you could improve on. And so it's a conversation, and you can develop a relationship. Don't attach your ego into what your, your kid is doing. <laughs> that's, a big, that's a big mistake. And it's not all about putting them in the backyard with a ball and hoop and just telling them to keep shooting. No, it's not. Although some of that is good too. Uh, it, it, because, you know, I think a big thing in, in my development and the development of players is a thing called imagination. And sometimes when you're just playing games and doing that, you don't imagine. Uh, I like the fact, one of my grandchildren, uh, Rem, spends a lot of time and he fantasizes games and, and what he's doing and, and you know there's a crowd and whatever and uh, I love that you know I think imagination is 
is a key component and uh, and you 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 have to be alone with your imagination and have your imagination be be your be your friend you know we we end up eventually being what we think about ourselves most mm-hmm. and so when I say imagination I'm not you're successful in your imagination. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not talking about dreaming now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking about imagination. And so you, 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 you can actually develop a little bit more self-esteem uh, by doing that and then try to put that into action when you are actually you know, with your group. Uh, I call it mental reps. You know, uh, I do it still today. Yeah, you know, when I speak, I don't. I do a lot of public speaking. I don't use notes, and I'll, um, you know, I'll get my thoughts together. I'll imagine myself on a stage, and and getting a bit of big applause and and all that. And uh, it's a good. Th- it's really. It's really an amazing thing. I I feel like we used to do that as kids a lot. Yeah. But now there are a lot of distractions for. For children to not use their own imagination, but rather, you know, they're on video games or watching TV or doing other well, things. Well, the that- other thing with that, Deborah, is uh, uh, you don't just have kids go to a playground and make up their own games. There's always a parent saying, you're on this team, you're on that team. You're, and I'm not saying all that's wrong, but uh, I know when, when we grew up, we didn't have parents around. Mm-mm. And we'd say, you know, we got eight guys, we're gonna do this game right now. What do you mean? No, let's do this game. And uh, let's choose sides. We're gonna play up to 11. You know, you, you were in control. You learned leadership. You learned how to imagine. Like, we got nine guys now where you're gonna be the automatic pitcher. I don't want to be the automatic pitcher. I was that last time. I said, you, you were really good at automatic pitcher. That might be a role that you, that you have from right now. But it was uh, the camaraderie that I've had with my buddies from the schoolyard is still there today. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with all the time that we spent with one another. And the teamwork that you learned, too. Teamwork and, uh, uh, and we... <laughs> I call, you know, I, some people say, how did you, you know, you're a leader. And my buddy Mo would say, well, I was Mick then. Mick was that when we were eight, mm-hmm. nine years old. And, uh, and I wasn't always, I was the best player in basketball, but I wasn't the best player in football or baseball. I was good, but not, and so I'm going to pick Danny Cush if I'm playing uh, baseball because he could hit the hell out of the ball. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to pick another one of my guys, you know, ahead of me in football because he, he better, he catches everything. And, uh, and I don't know, there's no jealousies or anything. You know, you just, hey, how can we have the best time together? We'll be right back with more of my conversation with Coach K. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download as I continue my conversation with former Duke men's basketball coach, Mike Krzyzewski. So I asked you what is good about not coaching anymore. Yeah. What is bad about not coaching anymore? Yeah, really, I, there hasn't been anything bad. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm being honest, I do not miss coaching. You know, that doesn't mean I don't love the game or because in order to coach, you have to prepare. And the amount of, you know, I was an ultimate preparer. I, I, need, I felt I needed to really uh, prepare. And that, that consumes time. And uh, in order, yeah, I, I say to a lot of people, I've loved what I've done my whole life. In order to do what you love, you don't always do everything that you love. And uh, the amount of time uh, for preparation and recruiting and the frequency of all that, you know, time's precious, especially as you get older. Uh, you, 
you know, I want to make better use of my time for me and my family. Uh, so I, I really do not miss it at all. I, uh, I'm obviously pulling for Duke. Uh, John and I have, John Shire and I have a, a great, great relationship. And, uh, and he's got to do his thing. And we, I need to be out of the way to allow him uh, to do that. Duke's out of the top 25 right now. Does it, it doesn't pull you back in at all saying, oh, I want to go in and fix something. They still have a great record. But. Yeah, no, you know, like we've been out of the top 25 when I coached too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, basically uh, a team right now in January is in the middle of the race. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the really important part of the race is coming up, especially in February. And you want to be in good enough position by the time you get there so you're not just sprinting you know, to get to the finish line. But uh, it's a process. And when you have young, we, have, we always have young teams now. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, a big win, a tough loss, those comb and it, it, that, that helps you mature, grow. Uh, it depends on how you use it. And I know John and his staff are, are using it well. How proud are you to see your former players now in head coaching? Yeah, no, I, you know, when I started coaching, I did it because I love the game and I, I just love coaching. I, I never imagined how good it would be to have my former players as friends and for them to have families and ki you know, kids. And, and then uh, so many of them would go into coaching uh, obviously, when a kid, uh, not, a guy went into uh, the pros, you know, you followed him in the pros. But a lot of guys didn't go into the pros. And then uh, a number of them wanted to be coaches. And almost 30 years ago, we just started saying, okay, any assistant I have uh, will be one of my players. They've all been one of my captains. The only stipulation I ask from them is that they don't come wanting to be an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. I want them to have the dream of being a head coach. And uh, once they say that, then I know they're going to try to learn everything. They're not just going to uh, use it as a transition from going from playing into whatever mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. they're, they want to do. Do you, do you see them growing as players and then therefore as coaches too? And, and that leadership that you've taught them as a player then comes out as a coach? Yeah, you know, I, I, you see them growing as people. Uh, they're, they, they're really, I know, they're boys, you know, when they come here. They're young men, but real young men. And then you see them develop, and you have to give them opportunities to develop. Um, the guys who are coaching pretty much are more from not the one-and-done era because it, it's pretty tough to get into coaching if you left after one year because you're going to be probably a really good player. Uh, an exception to that would be Emil Jefferson. You know, He was here for five years because of, a, of an injury. And we were fortunate uh, to get him in his late 20s because he could still be playing either in Europe or he'd have a, still have a chance in the NBA. We were lucky to get John Shire that way. Uh, John had a horrible injury occur to him right after he graduated, which cut his playing career together uh, short. And uh, uh, so I think he was 25 when he came here. That's, Nolan Smith was the, was the same way. And uh, so that's unusual. But most of the guys were here for multiple, in fact, all the guys were here for multiple years. And all of them have, were graduates of Duke. So they knew Duke, they knew me, and they had institutional memory before they ever mm -hmm. uh, even started working. Yeah, some of that you can't teach. You just no, have you know, to know it. And, and I don't, they have a better feel for what it is to be a student here than I do. And the other thing, Deborah, they're, they're, uh, they're more current. They're younger. 
you know. So for me, that's something I had to try to keep learning to stay current. I kept getting older, and the group I had to coach was the same age. Mm -hmm. How do you communicate with them? How do you uh, how do you Their coach them? Their music changed. You, you, you know, you, music, you came out dancing to some music. Yeah. I remember after one national. Well, champion. that's usually after we win. <laughs> uh, there's not much dancing after we lose, but the uh, no, and even you know to try to dress a little bit more, uh, not like a. I'm not knocking all seventy year olds, but not many have you know a Nike contract where they get a, a nice sweater. They got. Air Force Ones or mm -hmm. uh, Air Maxes or whatever, wh whatever it is, and uh, it's not just what you say, but you have to kind of look the part. That this you'll never look as athletic as those guys, or as handsome and whatever. But you can talk and look today in their world, you know, without uh, going going nuts about that. <laughs> have you been to a game in Cameron? I have not been to a game in Cameron. I've watched every game. Uh, uh, we're in my office. I've watched some of the games in here. Uh, in fact, I've used a couple of the games for fundraisers for the uh, Emily Krzyzewski Center, which is raised. Anyway, we have six viewings in here that will raise like about $400,000. And one big viewing when I host a wine celebration for the V Foundation in Napa. We've done it for 16 years. They have auction items, and one of the auction items was a weekend at Duke and a wine dinner and watch the game, and $150,000, twice. So, uh, you know, if we can, I'd rather do that. And but when I watch the game, I watch the game. Mm -hmm. You know, I take notes. Mm -hmm. Not not to tell John like, with three twenty two left in the first <laughs> half, boy, you really screwed up. But just to get a feel, mm -hmm. uh, a feel for for things. And it's been that's been kind of kind of neat because you know my office is kind of like a a basketball museum, and uh, uh, and you know there really isn't a place to watch the game and. Cameron for me. I don't want to be a distraction and uh, uh, I want to be supportive and give John and his staff space to develop the program that they're responsible for. They're responsible for the Duke basketball program right now. You still have this office because you are not retired. You are still working very hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't call it hard. I'm, I'm busy doing really good things. Okay. And so uh, my wife and I, we have lifetime contracts with Duke to be ambassadors for the school. But basically, I've been, we've been that uh, you know, when we were coaching. And so uh, we've kept the same office. Jerry Brown is still taking care of me. And uh, uh, we do a lot of things for uh, people at Duke, uh, people in Durham. Uh, we're here. Uh, obviously, fundraising is a big thing, not just for our program or athletic department, but for the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's hard to explain uh, the immense amount of mail and requests that we get that a lot of them we do, uh, and how they interact then in continuing to do what we did, which helps everybody, including our, our university. Why not just go golfing or go sit on a beach or go to Napa and drink yeah. wine? Yeah, well, I do, I don't golf, uh, so there's not, but I, you know, we live right next to the Duke Forest and we got 14 acres of land. I got a, a, a puppy now. Uh, it's not a puppy. <laughs> Coach is 11 months old. We got him at eight pounds, eight weeks, eight pounds. He's 85 pounds now. <laughs> and he's a heck of an athlete. He's a good guy. And I'd rather be out uh, outside. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, uh, when I retired, uh, thinking of retirement and talking to people, one word came up a lot was to have purpose, purpose, that when you get up in the morning, 
what's your purpose? Uh, you know, for me, I'm not knocking anyone whose purpose is to play golf and do that. That's cool. I, you know, that, I, that wouldn't be good for me. I have to have, like, goals. I have to, like, I do a lot of speaking for the Washington Speakers Bureau. I've been, I've probably had 20 to 25 engagements since August all over the United States. And, uh, and I like that. And it's interesting. I learned a lot. Uh, so if I'm speaking for a company, you have what they call content calls. It's a scouting report mm -hmm. about two, three weeks before. And then you study the company mm -hmm. and you talk about the event and where you are. And then, boom, the event. And, uh, uh, and that's, it's kind of like a game. Uh, and it's a performance. And I like that. I, uh, I, li I like it a lot, but I've learned a lot because I'm still studying leadership and teamwork. Uh, I'm not trying to figure out how to attack Beheim's zone or <laughs> somebody's press or think of the most intricate out-of-bounds play anymore. I don't think about any of those things. Uh, but uh, uh, I do think about teamwork, leadership, uh, how to have people come together, uh, how, to, how, how to transition from this COVID era that, era that we've had, that uh, a lot of companies were not together for two or three years, how you develop relationships again. It's incredibly interesting, and uh, I, I've loved that. And really similar talents that you already have. So it's just using them in a different way. Yeah, you know, so many things you do in sport is similar to what you would do in business. And basically you want to get people together to use their talents, at, to optimi optimally use their talents to a accomplish a goal. But the, the, the key thing with that is where they would want to do it again. A lot of times people define leadership the way I just did, but I add the thing, well, I can be a dictator and make you do it, but you never want to do it again. If we can do it in a way where we want to do it again and have learned from that, then that's leadership that leads to growth. And uh, that's the best kind. On our next episode, part two of my conversation with Mike Krzyzewski. He tells me about his last game in Cameron, the unforgettable 2022 Final Four and getting so close to that championship game. Don't miss it. Thanks for listening to the WREL Daily Download and making us part of your morning routine. Another great way to get WREL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email that's waiting in your inbox every morning with triangle news, events, and headlines to get you ready for the day. Sign up at WREL.com newsletter.